Well, good evening and welcome to our public lecture for this month. My name is Mark Reed. I'm a landslide researcher here in Menlo Park. And before tonight's pre presentation, I'd like to just mention uh, next month's presentation. There's a flyer on it in the back. It'll be given by Keith Miles. He's the director of the Western Ecological Research Center in Sacramento. The title of this talk is Ecological Stressors. It's a lot of work. W-E-R-C, it's a pun. Uh, science, science pun, I guess. Um, anyway, tonight's presentation is by Brian Collins. I've had the good fortune to work with Brian over the years, but he's a research civil engineer with the Landslide Hazards Program here in Menlo Park. He's worked on a lot of different hazards projects for the past 20 years, including 10 years with the USGS. He currently leads a variety of, of programs and projects ranging from predicting shallow landslides and debris flows here in the Bay Area to understanding the mobility of the deep-seated 2014 Oso slide. I've worked with him on that up in Washington. And he's looked at uh, studying rockfall hazards in Yosemite. Now, Brian has a degree from Purdue University, a master's from CU, University of Colorado in Boulder, and a PhD in geotechnical engineering from the University of California at Berkeley. And he's a registered professional engineer in California. But I think importantly, Brian is a, uh, a rock climber. He's climbed many of Yosemite's iconic faces. And so that background helps him pursue his research here. So I'll, with that, I'll let Brian try to inform you on that. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. And uh, are we good on this? Good. OK, thanks a lot. And uh, thank you all for coming out tonight. I know it's rainy, but uh, hopefully I'll keep you entertained with stories of rock falls in the Sierra. This is one of my favorite subjects uh, to study. I, as Mark pointed out, I, I, am, uh, I do research on a number of different landslide hazard projects. Uh, this one's been a favorite of mine. Um, partially because I get to work in Yosemite, which is a, a, a beautiful place to be, but also because it's, it's quite fascinating to take uh, all the different aspects of uh, science and apply them to what ends up being a fairly complex problem, and that is looking at rockfall triggering. So today we're going to be looking at rockfalls that are specifically caused from exfoliation type processes. And as I mentioned, the triggering processes, what leads to the detachment of the rockfalls. Um, this is, I think, the, the voice that I need to speak on for the back there. So, um, Now, our, our studies in the Sierra Nevada uh, are um, obviously Yosemite gives us that aspect. We're also going to be looking at, and I'm going to share some research from Twain Hart. Uh, Twain Hart's located on the way to Sonora Pass, east of Sonora. And so we'll be looking at some of those as other examples of exfoliation processes. So we're going to start with a blast here, and this is Twain Hart. Um, as I mentioned, Twain Hart's on, uh, um, on Highway 108, and this uh, granitic dome that you see in the foreground forms the left abutment of a 30-foot tall concrete arch dam that holds a small reservoir. And in 2014, this dome spontaneously fractured. And some of you may have seen this on YouTube. I'm going to share a video here of that. Um, one of our colleagues and a consultant on the job to investigate this failure, Scott Lewis, took this video, and it's quite spectacular, so I'm going to play it a couple times. So let me start again, and I'll pause it here so you can pay attention to this area. That's the area that fractured. And this is not, there's no dynamite involved in this. These are, these are people out there who heard popping, loud, cracking noises, ran out there with cameras, and happened to capture this. So this is not an anthropogenic type thing. This is just, wow, what happened? And you can see one more time. Now, it turns out that that was uh, some of the smaller exfoliation that happened at this location. This was the third event out of a sequence of five. The first two really damaged another part of the, uh, the dome. 
And so that's why these people were keen on being out there, so that they knew that it had been cracking days prior. And so when they heard it again, they said, let's get out there and see how it works. And they were pretty close to it. Um, these popping noises had been happening for a couple minutes. And so that's why they were chasing around with cameras, like, where is it coming from? Where is it coming from? So I'll start off by defining exfoliation. Um, as a, a process that's forming these rock joints in the Sierra Nevada and other places in the world. So exfoliation is common in granitic rocks specifically, but it can form in, in basically all rock types. And we see evidence for that um, in things like the Navajo sandstone of Utah um, and uh, uh, metamorphic rocks as well. So this, this process is how surface parallel joints form. So surface parallel fractures, it's that, that formation. And you see that here, this is the, the side of Half Dome. The cables route is just over here off of the picture. And then this is the northwest face, the steep side of Half Dome. So the, the uh, exfoliation joints are typically curved. You see that here um, in this aspect. And they're thicker and more widely spaced at depth. So what you see here is the, the surface. This is the shallow part of it, and they're very thin, and they're thinly spaced. Um, people have found exfoliation-type features down to about 100 meters, I think, but then they, they typically do die out. Geologically, they're young. In, in the Sierra, they're post-glacial, so that means they're less than 10,000 years old, which in geological time is very, very young. Um, so we'll look at, at that, and we're, as I mentioned, we're going to look at exfoliation in the Sierra Nevada, but I should say that the processes that we're talking about are, uh, occur worldwide. And I have a couple of examples here. One um, exfoliation features down low uh, here, uh, some nice exposures of exfoliation-type sheets. And then this is Cannon Cliff in New Hampshire on the East Coast. And all this area is, is great exfoliation examples. So we see those examples here in the US and also uh, around the world. So why do rocks exfoliate in the first place? Why are exfoliation joints there? That is a very complicated issue. And I have a fairly wordy, complicated slide to just start talking about that. But we're not actually going to, uh, I'm not going to be talking too much about the initiation and the formation of, of exfoliation joints. Instead, I'm going to be focused on what happens once they're formed and how do they finally detach into rockfall processes. That said, I think it's important to at least point out some background on the complex history and the complex research that's gone into trying to explain why we have dome structures in Tuolumne Meadows and big, huge slab failures like this in Yosemite Valley. The first observations, first uh, written accounts at least, come from uh, Germany in the early 1800s, where they were just trying to explain why these mountains uh, have these domal type shapes and have these layering type structures. And in California, closer to home, um, Whitney in the mid 1800s tried to explain that. And a multitude of different processes has been suggested for these. Whitney had suggested that, uh, that the exfoliation joints were there when the Pluton, when the Sierra Nevada, actually the batholith cooled, when the granite cooled, and then the cooling process caused these fractures to form. That's pretty much been dismissed because the, the cooling was uh, at depth, and if it cooled, that should happen for a lot larger depth. And these granites have now been exhumed all the way to the surface. And we know that these, it, it, for the most part, these joint sets are younger than the, the age of the Pluton, being hundreds of millions of years. Um, where here we know that they're less than 10,000 years. So uh, some of these the theories have, have been proposed and dismissed by various researchers. Uh, an early uh, researcher in the 1800s suggested that temperature might have something to do with it. Those were observations made by Shaler on the east coast of the United States in uh, New England, who just wrote a paper that basically suggested that because the temperatures on the coast of Maine are very, very cold and it gets very, very hot in the summertime, that, that might be suggestive that the temperature is playing a role. We have a multitude of other reasons that have more to do with the stresses in the rock and the stresses in the surface. Uh, Gilbert suggested that the removal of overburden and the removal of glaciers from the valleys in the Sierra might be leading the rocks to uh, flex outwards, to go into tension, and that could be the cause of that. Similarly, John's on the East Coast looking at quarries, rock quarries, granite quarries in New England, suggested that when you remove the rock on the surface, that was related to the opening up of these exfoliation joints. 
Uh, we have examples from Australia as well um, that suggest that the rock is in some form of compression uh, and that the compressive forces are, are actually what's forcing these slabs up off the ground. More recently, a researcher that I work with in, um, uh, in Hawaii, I haven't been there, but he's based at the University of Hawaii, Steve Martell, suggests that if you have a curved surface in compression, you can actually get a tensile uh, force that's strong enough to open up an exfoliation joint. And so this is sort of rewriting a lot of the, or revisiting a lot of the research that's gone into this over the past 200 years. So the bit still continues. People have their own theories and people have uh, dismissed and um, projected and suggest other theories, but it's a really active field. And I think some of the research that's coming out, particularly by, by Steve Martell, is gonna help us explain exfoliation uh, even more. And that's the, the formation story. So uh, I think that there's a lot of things that could be causing exfoliation joints to form in the first place. It's probably a complex story. And fortunately, I'm gonna just sidestep that whole issue. And we'll, we'll move on instead to not what makes these beautiful landscapes in the first place, but, um, oops, but what causes the fracturing once they're formed. So here is an example. This is Charlotte Dome in the Southern Sierra in Kings Canyon National Park. And we have these beautiful exfoliation sheets. And the question is, at what point is this sheet gonna fall down, or this sheet, or this sheet, or this sheet, or this sheet, and so on and so forth. So the joints are already there. The exfoliation sheets are already formed, but they're somehow still attached to the rock. What's it gonna take to, to cause a rock fall? And why is that important? Well, when we have uh, lots of visitors to Yosemite National Park and there's rock falls at the same time, then that poses a hazard and considerable risk to the public. And so this has been work that I've gotten involved with working with Yosemite National Park over the past seven years and working in particular with the, the first National Park geologist, Greg Stock, who's spearheaded many, many different types of studies on rock fall in the park. So uh, this, this confluence of the rock falls and the public gives us the motivation for studies and particularly for trying to do something to make headway to look at the hazard and risk for situations like this. This is a, a cabin, hard-sided cabin that got hit by a very large boulder in 2008. The people that were in this uh, cabin had woken up early for breakfast that morning and uh, nobody was in there. But you can imagine that if their schedule had changed just a little bit, this would have been a very serious case. So as part of these studies, we've done a bunch of different things. One of the most important, I think, is performing a hazard and risk assessment for Yosemite Valley for rockfall. And we had the good fortune that the administration was very receptive to actually moving on the suggestions of uh, these reports. And so because of that, the uh, Yosemite moved and closed different tent cabins and repurposed different situations. And that's actually reduced the rockfall risk considerably. It was slightly unpopular in some uh, people's minds because moving tent cabins and hard-sided cabins that had been there for a long time had a historical basis. Um, you know, some people would have liked to keep them that way, but the, the scientific story is that those cabins were actually built on the depositional environments of rock falls. They were built on talus slopes. And we generally don't like to put anything on a talus slope when we know that this is where the rocks are gonna land. So that's been a, a big, big uh, first and important step um, for, for addressing rockfall risk. Another thing that we've done in Yosemite is compile a database of all the rockfalls that have been recorded over time, starting in 1857, and this database uh, was released in 2011. It's publicly available. It has narratives and uh, descriptions from uh, people that were observing the rockfalls at the time. And this was a study that was initially begun by Jerry Wazork, who worked at the USGS for a long time and really was one of the pioneers of the USGS for working in Yosemite. He did a, d a bunch of different studies and he published along with Jim Snyder, who's the, who was the park historian, the first database. And then Greg and I, a few years ago, updated that. This database contains 925 rockfall descriptions and uh, provides uh, an ability to start looking at the statistics of rockfalls there. So on average, there's about, a, currently, we record a rockfall about once a week on average. 
Uh, now that's not to say that there aren't more than that that aren't that don't go recorded as well, but it's basically proof that Yosemite, being a wild uh, place, is geologically active in this in this way. So this is a plot that Greg has put together. Greg Stock, as I mentioned, the, the park geologist. This looks at the number of rock falls here on the y axis here over time, 1857 on the left, 2011 on the right. So the number of recorded rock falls, you can see that not much was recorded in the 1800s. And then there was some reporting here in the early to mid 1900s. And all of a sudden, in the 2000s, there's all sorts of rock falls being reported. And I keep saying rock falls reported because coincidentally, in 2006, or I should say not coincidentally, um, Greg Stock started working there and started talking to all the rangers and saying, hey, if you see a rock fall, tell me about it. I'm the park geologist. And so that reporting rate, uh, you know, at first glance might suggest that the, the number of rock falls in Yosemite is increasing, but really it's the reporting rate. But people are observing these things and everybody's walking around with a camera taking pictures of these things and, and posting it online or telling people about it. So this, this database is really increasing in size. The, the red plot uh, on the same graph is the number of visitors to Yosemite. And basically what that shows is currently about 4 million people per year that really gives us that impetus for looking at this, this hazard and risk type perspective. Now the bottom plot is another sort of proof that we use to show that this reporting rate is the, the reason for the seemingly increasing number of rock falls over time. When we look at just the largest rock fall during any time period, um, that pretty much stays the same at about 10,000 cubic meters each event. And that, uh, the fact that that hasn't changed over time gives us an indication. We know that over time, basically, somebody should have been reporting the biggest ones. These are the ones that you know, are, are uh, being felt far and wide throughout the valley. And so those haven't really changed, and so we, we uh, presume that the rockfall rate um, is at least not increasing not from the data that we have. So as I mentioned, there's people walking around Yosemite all the time with cameras taking pictures of the amazing scenery. And one of those was caught spectacularly on camera by a visitor from New York, Robert Atkinson, who took this video. Look right up here. Look at that piece. So that's 78 cubic meters, about the size of 24 mid-sized cars coming off that cliff. Look at it one more time. Look at that piece. Now he captured what would what would be the third event. Of, the, of that sequence. There was two other pieces that popped off here earlier, um, I think a few minutes prior. And so that was part of the reason why he captured such good video was something's going on over there and, and turned his camera and got that. That sort of video being provided to the park uh, allows us to do so many things with it from looking at you know just the magnitude, the size of these to understanding where the source area of the rockfall is. Um, that's often very difficult. We know, you know, in some cases there's a rockfall deposit, but where on the cliff did it come from? So these sorts of observations are, are really uh, spectacular and, and uh, very useful for us. So looking at that database in a little bit more detail, the where, the when, and the why, uh, I have shown here a geological map of Yosemite Valley. Uh, let's get the mouse back up. Here's Half Dome. Here's El Capitan, Yosemite Falls, and Glacier Point for reference. And these are all the different rock types. And I've shown here in this key, um, hopefully you can, yeah, you can read this text here at the bottom. So the Sentinel Granodiorite outcrops here in eastern Yosemite. It has the greatest number of events per cliff area per year. So this is normalized over the amount of cliff and over time. So that's sort of a standard unit to compare each rock type one to the other. So these two units here between the Kuna Crest Grand and Diorite and the Sentinel have the largest number of events per year. We think that could be partially uh, because there's a lot more reporting that goes on in eastern Yosemite Valley. That's where all the visitor facilities are, Curry Village, Glacier Point, Iwani, so on and so forth. 
And so that could be part of the reason. The other uh, reason is that these rocks are actually have some, uh, some fabric to them, some alignment of the minerals. And they tend to be, they form um, more highly jointed rocks. And so that could be providing weaknesses that then different triggering mechanisms can take advantage of. That could explain that. We see very large volumes of rock falls here from El Capitan. And so that's on the, the other y-axis here, the volume of the rock falls per cliff area per year. And we think that's because this, uh, the El Capitan granite is so massive that it doesn't have a lot of joints in it. And so when it does break, it breaks in very large pieces. When we look at the timing of rock falls, this tells uh, not much of a story. <laughs> we, it basically tells us that rock falls happen all year long, and there actually is not a rock fall season. Um, and we think that that has to do with the fact that there's a multitude of different triggering mechanisms. So in the wintertime, freeze-thaw type processes could be affecting it. In the springtime, precipitation, rainfall could be causing rock falls. So we can't really tease out too much of a pattern from this sort of data other than taking home that you should be aware of rock falls all the time. Now the why gets to this triggering, and this will lead into the majority of what I want to talk about today. Looking at all the potential triggering mechanisms for rock falls here on the right graph. Precipitation related rock falls account for 62% of the data. Freeze thaw caused rock falls only 7%. That was pretty interesting because I think a lot of people think that in the high Sierra that freeze thaw is the, the predominant reason for rock falls happening. It's, it's actually just a small fraction compared to these other mechanisms. Yeah, that's right. So that's a good question. And uh, the reason for that is basically temporal coincidence. So if there is an earthquake and a rock falls off of a cliff, then we usually assign an earthquake type trigger. If it's raining and a rock falls off the cliff, similarly for precipitation. So we, it's a temporal coincidence, I would say, that we're trying to link those processes to what's going on that day. Not to say that you know some other thing could have been happening, but it's... Um, I think that's the best we can do with the data, the observations that we have out there. When we group all of the other uh, triggering mechanisms, put those here, 18%, precipitation accounts for 29%, we still have, out of the entire database, 50%, almost 50, uh, over 50% are unexplained in some way. So this was a subset of the database that we could actually positively assign a trigger on, that so we had enough information from the observations, either meteorologically or seismically, to say, yeah, this is, this is pretty much the reason for that rock fall. It's 361 events out of the 925. This subset is 770 out of 925, and the reason why it's not 925 out of 925 is because some of them we just have literally zero information on. There's a report from a superintendent's uh, note that says there was a rock fall in you know, 1890 or something like that, so we really can't even attempt to do anything with it. The other two categories, unrecognized and unknown, are a little bit more specific. Unknown means that there's enough information to know that the rockfall, let's say, came from a particular place, but we can't uh, make any determinations. There's just not enough information. Uh, the other cases, we, we literally can't even uh, assign any information to it. Here we have a little bit known, but not enough to, to make anything. The unrecognized, on the other hand, are rockfalls where they were fully captured, so we know everything about them. They were observed. We have pictures or video or first-hand accounts. We know what the weather conditions were at the time. We know whether there was an earthquake or not, and we can't explain it. These are rock falls similar to the video that we showed, that I just showed, saying that this is very well. We know exactly what was happening, and we still don't know why. So it wasn't raining that day, and there hadn't been an earthquake, so why that rock fall then? So that's the unrecognized ones. And those are the ones that were particularly interesting to us when we started wanting to, to investigate rock fall triggering more. So why can't we explain 26% of the data? What, something has to be causing it. So this led us to... Um, start looking at a little bit more in depth at triggering mechanisms. And as I mentioned, some of these are, there's obvious triggers and there's, there's not so common triggers. Wind, lightning, root wedging. 
In fact, if you look at the database, the lightning uh, entries are quite interesting. This is when somebody, uh, unfortunately, was out on a cliff and saw lightning strike. They probably shouldn't have been out on the cliff at the time, but they saw a rock fall immediately after the lightning strike. Like the rocks fell from where the lightning struck the rock. So that's a lightning-type triggering mechanism that gets assigned. But many are still un unexplained, as I mentioned. And in particular, uh, since Greg's been in the park for a long time, he started noticing that a lot of these were during the summertime, during these Sierra beautiful blue sky days, and he couldn't assign a trigger to them because there's nothing obvious. So those are the ones we said we should think about this a little bit more. And that led us to this question, why do rockfalls sometimes occur in the absence of any identified trigger? And here's two photos of those instances. Look at the, the color of the sky there. There's just, it's a beautiful day, and we don't know why these rock falls are occurring. I also want to point out the time and the day on those. This, the left one's in July, and uh, early evening, we should say. And the right one's in August, in mid-afternoon. That's important, keep those in mind. Because then we thought, okay, hot summer days, hot afternoons, maybe has something to do with the temperature. Let's, let's go revisit what Shaler first proposed in New England. And there's lots of examples of this, um, including those from India where people have documented the lighting of fires to quarry rock. So they can build fires along a rock surface, get that rock to heat up, and it actually separates from the rock, and then they get a nice slab of granite they can pull away and and build with it. So this was some of the inspiration for taking on a study on thermal triggering. Is heat enough to cause rock falls? And there's been, a, you know, this isn't a theory that we're proposing. As I mentioned, uh, it's, it's been proposed several times, but we wanted to see if we could quantify this in much more detail. And so when we look at the record, when we look at that database, what we saw was that between July and September, the hot months in the Yosemite, between 12 p.m. and 6 p.m., the hot afternoons, there were two and a half times more rock falls happening compared to if that was spread over a random distribution. So the number of rock falls, if it was randomly distributed throughout those months and throughout those times, the data set shows that two and a half more times is actually occurring. So that gave us even more inspiration, I guess, to take on this, this study. And so we designed an experiment, and the experiment was, let's go find an exfoliation flake that's partially attached, partially detached from the rock. Let's measure it. Let's see if it moves when it heats up. And let's measure the temperature, both on the inside and the outside, and we'll make measurements for a while. And uh, a while, I think, in our mind was, well, let's do this for a few months. And actually, uh, upon inspiration from Mark Reed, who introduced me, we decided to do it a little bit longer and a little bit longer, and a little bit longer. <laughs> and, and we're really glad we did. So thanks to Mark for pushing us in that direction because we captured what I'll show, I think, is a, a pretty spectacular data set. So our experiment is here. This is the Royal Arches. This is the Rhombus Wall. And there's a hotel down here that some may know by this name, some may know by that name. And this is... Uh, the rock study area here in the, the red box. And this is an exfoliation sheet. It's laid back at about 70 degrees. It's fairly steep, but not dead vertical. We installed custom-designed crack meters, is what we call these. This is a, a sensor that measures how much that opening opens and closes over time. And we installed temperature sensors on the outside of the flake and temperature sensors on the inside of the flake. And uh, the geometry is such that the entire flake is detached. It's completely open. It's hollow in the back. If you slam on it, you hear that, that hollow sound. It is attached up at the top, and it's attached down at the bottom. It's about 19 meters tall, 4 meters wide, and you can see here about 10 centimeters thick. So it's a very long, thin feature, which is actually very typical of lots of exfoliation sheets in Yosemite. This wasn't uh, an anomalous sheet at all. This is very typical. Now, we had these crack meters designed to be very, very precise. We weren't sure what we were going to measure out there. 
we figured it would be a, a fraction of a millimeter. So in the conversations I had with the manufacturer, I said, you, you know, please give us your best design, you know, the best resolution, the best precision, best accuracy in this instrument. And they did. They gave us something that would read down to a hundredth of a millimeter. And I had to apologize to them shortly thereafter because it turned out we didn't need that kind of accuracy. These sheets were actually moving by almost a centimeter a day. And this is the data from that. So this is a uh, three days in July of 2010. And this is the relative deformation. So starting here, this is, uh, they were zeroed. Uh, and this shows that signal that uh, over three days, uh, moving inwards during the early hours of the day, moving back outwards, moving inwards, moving outwards, and so on and so forth. But look at the magnitude. It's going six millimeters in the positive direction, four in the negative. So a span of almost a centimeter per day. We had a control crack meter. That's one that we put in there that was not attached to the flake just to make sure that the instruments themselves weren't picking up some thermal signal of their own, that the, the instruments weren't heating up over time. That is the thin blue line. And you can see that it, it does heat up. It has a slight signature to it, but it, it's much, much smaller than the signal that we were measuring from the sheet. And these are the values of three different crack meters, upper, middle, and lower. So they all measure that same pattern. Now with that in mind, um, we said, wow, that's a whole lot. Why do we need these crack meters? Why don't we just go up there with a the tape measure? <laughs> so we did. <laughs> we had to prove to ourselves that we were actually making sense, that we were actually getting this right. So we climbed back up there and, and measured it with the tape measure. It's there. It's true. You can measure it in the, the daytime, measure it in the nighttime, and you get the virtually the same answer. But we also do lots of sophisticated monitoring for other projects, and we have access to these tools which one of those is terrestrial LIDAR, which is something I do a lot of in other projects. And so we applied that tool to this to, to see if we could actually measure the deformation of the entire sheet. So these were just point measurements we're getting the, at the three instruments. Terrestrial LIDAR is a surveying technique that collects thousands of points per second. It's like a very high-powered uh, radar. It can measure the exact trajectory and the exact orientation, the exact distance to a point. So we set this up at the base of the cliff and shot it from uh, over the course of several hours, including over a single night. And when you compare the data from, let's say, late afternoon until the very next morning, when the sheet should be moving in the most, what we got was this pattern here, a contractive pattern shown in orange of the sheet moving back into the flake, uh, back into the cliff. Of about that same magnitude, here in the middle, six millimeters for this particular day and nine millimeters. So we were, ca we were again convinced we we're capturing the right magnitude. This data isn't from the same day as I just showed, but it, it did coincide exactly with the values from the crack meters for that particular time. So the flake's moving in and out quite a bit. Um, what are the temperatures doing? Temperatures, as we would expect, rise during the day and fall during the night. What was very interesting about that was that the inside of the flake um, really doesn't, well, it also increases in temperature, but there's a big temperature gradient between the outside and the inside. And that's important when we do analyses. Now we have two reasons for the, uh, the sheet of rock potentially deforming. One is that the temperature of the whole thing is going up. The second is that we have a thermal gradient across, and a thermal gradient will actually cause uh, rocks to behave in a certain manner, and we'll, I'll talk about that in a little bit, but those two components are important, that the, the whole rock is heating up and there's a gradient across that sheet. When we look at the temperature signal and the deformation signal in the same plot, that's what this looks like. So we have temperature here on the y-axis and the crack apertures, so that's the, the, the gap behind the sheet. Here we have four days plotted, and I'll step you through it, starting here at midnight on June 12th. And what we see is that for between, between midnight and 6 o'clock in the morning, the temperatures are still dropping. So temperatures started at about 14 degrees, and now they're 10 degrees at 6 o'clock in, in the morning. This is temperatures in degrees Celsius. And the, the crack was, was starting to, or was continuing to close. At 6 o'clock in the morning, things started to heat up, and it just absorbed heat for three hours. It didn't move at all. It was just out there absorbing and getting hotter and hotter and hotter. At 9 o'clock, all of a sudden, it turns a corner, and the sheet starts to move outwards. It's also continuing to get hot during the day, but it's really moving outwards. And here in this particular day, about 7 millimeters. 
Then in the mid-afternoon, it starts to cool off. It gives off heat back to the environment. It starts to cool down. It doesn't have any movement for a, a few hours. And then it starts to come back again. So that's that day, day one. That is a near-surface rock temperature. Okay. Yep. So then the second day is here. And the temperatures were slightly uh, hotter on this day. But we see the same pattern again of it opening back up again, cooling, and closing back down again. Here's a third day, June 14th, and it absorbs heat similarly, comes out, and comes back down again, and then the fourth day of, of what I've shown here in the plot. So not only is it going around in a cycle, but over the course of four days, it's actually building, and it's moving further and further outwards over time. And that's uh, pretty interesting, because now we understand that these aren't the, the rocks are just not moving back and forth according to you know, fixed positions. It actually can sequentially move outwards over time. That cycle um, has analogies to it. And when I showed this cycle to a mechanical engineering friend of mine, he instantly pointed out that that must be a Carnot cycle. And for those not familiar with Carnot cycle, this was an invention uh, discovery by Sadie Carnot, who worked on this in the early 1800s. He was looking at the efficiency of steam engines. At the time, they only had a few percent efficiency. And he knew that uh, there were ways to improve upon that. And as part of those studies, he actually defined what would be a, a theoretically perfectly efficient heat engine. And that is the definition of a Carnot cycle. This is temperature here on the y-axis and entropy, uh, the uh, measure of randomness in the system on the y-axis. It's not too important for understanding, but I'll step you through what works, wh how a heat engine works. You, heat, you give the heat engine some, some increase in temperature. It absorbs energy and then does work on the system. So if it's a, if it's a steam piston, then that piston is going to move up, let's say. And then we lose heat to the environment, and the piston moves down again. And in a perfect cycle, you wouldn't have any heat losses, and you wouldn't have any frictional losses, and you'd get back to exactly where you started again. That would be the perfect engine. And the reason why this was a big discovery at the time, because it showed that they shouldn't be just dealing with a few percent, that they can do a lot better than that, and that this is the, the best they can do. So this was the goal, and that led to a lot of advances in steam engine efficiency. Now, the reason why I talk about Carnot cycles is because uh, this friend of mine who pointed out this analogy, I think was quite correct, in that although here we're measuring crack aperture and on the, in the Carnot cycle we're measuring entropy, clearly two totally different uh, measurements. But the same analogy could be made that here the flake absorbs heat, just like a uh, heat engine would, and then does work on the system. It moves outwards, just like a piston does. And then it loses heat back to the environment, and it moves back again. And so the cycle of the, the flake moving in and out and in and out is doing work on its environment. And that working, uh, that work is both the movement and potential uh, deformation of the rock. So those are the daily cycles and uh, the short-term uh, cycles over several days. When we look at seasonal cycles and yearly cycles, we see something also very interesting. Uh, one of the things that's potentially obvious would be that the crack, the, that the sheet moves in the most during the winter time. So here's December 10, 2010, December 2011. So it's, it's closest to the cliff when it's coldest, uh, closest to the cliff when it's coldest, and it's farthest away from the cliff when it's hottest, during the hottest months. But over the three-year time span, we saw that the opening was actually increasing. And what I show here, these dots, are the maximum monthly crack aperture. So out of every month that we measured, and this is, we measured these, uh, these crack meters at five-minute intervals. So we take the maximum of every month and we plot that on this graph. And the maximums actually increased over time over those three years. And the most obvious thing to check on that was, well, did the temperatures increase also over the course of the three years? They did not, it turned out. So we know that this is presumably capturing permanent deformation of the rock face, that over time it's slowly moving away from the cliff. That makes perfect sense when you consider that rock falls are happening. The rocks are not becoming more attached to the cliff. Eventually they're falling off. And I think that this actually is some clear proof that over time, uh, these sheets can open up and eventually detach. And so that opening is captured here. Now the opening is about half to one millimeter per year for this particular flake that we measured. We don't think that's uh, 
a linear value that you can project back in time. If that's the case, then this sheet was only there for about 100 years, which we think is a little short. But uh, the point is that it could be a nonlinear relationship where maybe a long time ago it was only moving outwards by, let's say, 0 0.01 millimeters per year. And then as it more moved farther and farther out, it was able to absorb more heat because now the back and the front can become uh, hotter during the day and cooler at the night and so on and so forth. So this is a, a metric that I think is important but uh, can't be applied ubiquitously uh, back in time. Probably a nonlinear relationship. So one question I get asked a lot about this is how did we collect our data? And as Mark pointed out, I am a rock climber and so is Greg and that came in very handy for this study. So I have here a picture of the two of us uh, collecting our data. So here's the, the data logger. Here's Greg. Uh, that's what it looks like on the cliff. We're hanging from, from ropes that we set up. And uh, most of the time we had this, this great weather to do it, but it wasn't always fun. Um, we resorted to raincoats and umbrellas when we were trying to get that data because this is a data logger that's recording that data and we had to go get that data periodically. So that's how we do this kind of experiment up there. Um, pretty neat, pretty fun thing to do. Rock climbers did not uh, disturb this. We had done quite a bit of public outreach uh, with the rock climbing community, and uh, we had notes uh, on this equipment saying, please don't pull me <laughs> or clip gear to me or fall on me. So, and it turned out this route isn't that popular of a route. Um, so it, it was, uh, we mitigated that, uh, that effect. So turning back to the effects of this movement of this deformation in and out all day, is it really enough to fracture rock though? We know that it's moving, but this rock sheet did not detach and we were thankful of that because I think we would have been blamed for sticking a, a car jack in, in behind it and prying it loose. Um, that we did not do. Um, but it did not fall down and so you know, we don't have that proof positive that it can actually fracture rock. But we can examine rock fracture in other ways. We can look at it and find these beautiful exposures at all different scales. So here's four centimeters of a little tiny piece of rock that's actually peeling away from the rock surface, probably thermally induced. Here's a much larger feature, 10 meters long, similar to the one that we, we monitored, a little bit smaller in scale. And I'm going to use three analogies, and this comes from my civil engineering background of, of bridges, buildings, and boats to explain how rock fracture might be occurring and how the heat contributes to the deformation of these exfoliation sheets. So we'll use principles of thermodynamics, structural engineering, and fracture mechanics to get there. And I th uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, this is an exciting topic for me, but uh, one of the reasons behind that is being able to grasp all of these different areas of science and engineering and bring them together to try to explain what we see out there. And I think all of these pieces are actually necessary to, to get to the point that we're at. So rocks are like bridges, and here's how. When you heat up a bridge, for example, and unfortunately in a fire, this is Liberty Bridge in Pittsburgh that uh, caught fire in March of this past year. This was, a, I believe, a welding um, job that caught some of the scaffolding or the, the tarps caught fire. Uh, this led to some deformation <coughs> of the steel beams that you can see here. And so how are rocks like bridges? Well, the steel beams heated up and they wanted to deform. And this is the same sort of analogy as we have expansion joints and bridges, that when the bridge heats up, you have to accommodate the thermal expansion of the material. And if you don't, then you get deformations. And so that's the same thing as uh, what we see in rocks, is that when you heat the, the rock face up, it does want to expand. But it can't because it's actually pinned. This isn't free to expand as much as it wants on both sides. It's actually attached to a much larger cliff face that's, that's providing resistance to it. So when it heats up like that, stresses are built up, forces are built up at the end members. And uh, Newton's law tells us that there's an equal and opposite reaction into it. So the, the exfoliation sheet wants to expand, but instead it's, it's being held there between two end members, and so there's some forces and stresses that develop at the cliff, uh, at the, uh, the ends of the exfoliation sheet. 
This is an image taken by colleagues of ours uh, that come over periodically from Switzerland to do research in Yosemite. Uh, they obviously have uh, lots of rockfall issues in Switzerland, and so we cooperate very closely with them. They applied a thermal camera uh, to take pictures sequentially over time and caught that same signal, but we were able to see the entire signal over the entire rock with that thermal camera image. Basically, what this is, tells us is, yes, indeed, the rock is heating up everywhere. Uh, like this, and we can do some, some pretty neat uh, experiments with that data. So what happens when the rocks heat up? And what happens when buildings heat up and bridges heat up? Well, they end up deforming. And the way that they end up deforming, unfortunately, in fires is that they buckle. And you can see here, this is the Windsor Tower in Madrid, Spain in 2005 that caught fire. The building was about a 30-story building. It was built in 1979, and it was undergoing renovation uh, unfortunately for, uh, for them at the time, they were actually putting in sprinkler systems into the building and doing some fireproofing. Nobody was, was in the building at the time. Nobody uh, died from uh, this building fire. But it did give an example of some, some quite dramatic deformations in the, uh, in the steel members. And you can see some of that, that deformation here, the buckling. This is what it looked like afterwards. And you can see here that when those steel beams heated up, they weren't allowed to expand because they're attached to the rest of the structure. And so instead, they buckled. They deformed outwards. So again, this analogy of, of the rock heating up, and instead of expanding, it can't. And so instead, it's going to bow. And it's the same sort of thing. If you take a yardstick between your hands and push on it, it's going to push out. It's going to bow and deform. And so that's the analogy we can make with buildings, that rocks are like buildings and that if you heat them up and you don't allow them to move, they're going to bow outwards. They're going to buckle under those stresses at the ends. And the final analogy is what happens when that does happen, that it does bow outwards, and then it cools down, and it bows back inwards again. And let's say you do that many, many, many times. Well, there's been some very interesting research that comes to us out of the, the boat design industry. And I have an example here of some of the Liberty ships that were built during World War II. This one, the USS Ponegansett, was built here in Sausalito in 1943 and served in the um, Pacific arena for several years until the end of World War II. It was a water tanker that was supplying potable water to uh, troops in the Pacific. Following World War II, it spent, well, I should say, it spent all of its time in the warm, South Pacific Ocean. That's important because after World War II, it was decided to be repurposed and salvaged, and it was sent over to the East Coast. And when it spent some time in the cold, icy waters off the coast of Boston, this happened. The boat split right in two. And upon investigation, it was determined that some of the welds that had been put on this boat, those welds had been tested under uh, the temperature regime that it thought the boat was going to experience, which was the warm waters of the Pacific Ocean. It hadn't been tested at the colder temperatures of the Atlantic. And so the microflaws in the welding process formed into larger and larger cracks in that cyclical nature that a boat uh, undergoes during the course of sailing over thousands and millions of ocean waves eventually caused those cracks to become bigger, 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 and then it had a critical stress propagation, and those cracks just riddled right through um, that ship. And so this wasn't just a one case. They actually had a lot of examples of these ships uh, breaking in two like this. So that led to uh, lots of discoveries in terms of fracture mechanics and how you make sure that wells do not break over time. It's the reason why we have sort of oblique circular windows on airplanes, too. They like to avoid sharp corners because those are stress concentration points that then fracture eventually. And those you know, airplane loads are subjected to many, many cycles over time. So lots of uh, this was unfortunate. Um, uh, failure of this boat, but lots of big discoveries in terms of material science came out of that. So what's the analogy back to the rocks sheets of Yosemite? Well, eventually, if we move that sheet back and forth over time, and it's bowing, and it's coming back, and it's bowing, and it's coming back, it's going through that same type of cycles. And we think that that's enough for it to fracture. And we can see examples of that throughout the Sierra Nevada. Uh, this is an example of an event that happened in Twainheart, back to that video at the beginning that I showed, of the rock buckling, basically. It's just snapping in two like that and moving upwards. Maybe it had been sub subjected to enough cycles of stress over time. We can test this in the laboratory, and we are. We work with colleagues, again, in a different laboratory in Switzerland, 
we send them cores of rocks from Yosemite and they put it in this device, this is a cyclic loader, and this is a fracture toughness type test. So what we're doing right now is we're loading, we, we have a cylinder, uh, cylinder of rock, this is half dome granodiorite, we put a small crack in the middle and then we load it with a small load, not enough to fracture it right away under one cycle, instead just a fraction of that uh, maximum load. And then we do that a lot and we measure the number of cycles that we, that we get. And the purpose of this is to see if we can uh, determine how many cycles does it take to eventually crack this rock. And are the thermal stresses generated by what I just showed in all those analogies um, with buildings, boats, and bridges, are those thermal stresses that are created at the ends enough to eventually cause this to crack with a, a number of cycles? So that's, that's the research, the current research that I'm involved in is following through on that part of the study. We know that failure must be cyclic in a way because if the rocks were stressed at some point just once because of temperature variations, then it wouldn't really explain why all these flakes are still here. They should have fallen off if it was the thermal trigger. So instead we know that the thermal trigger must be cyclic in nature. It must take a long time to develop. It's gotta be many, many cycles eventually lead to the fracture. So can the fracture lead to rock falls? Well, um, I think you know we do have a lot of case studies now that might suggest that. This is another rock fall off of uh, the rhombus wall, the video that I showed. And I'll play that again, because now you can look at it maybe with some different eyes. So these are all exfoliation look sheets. Look at that piece. And this is a piece of that exfoliation sheet that's eventually falling away. So maybe the thermal cycles are acting on all these sheets over time and eventually some of them are gonna fail and maybe at some other point in time another one's gonna fail. It's not to say that the whole cliffs um, are gonna fail all at once because of this. This is just one potential trigger. We know that there's lots of other triggers as I discussed before. But it's one thing that can cause it. So let's look back at those unrecognized triggers that, that uh, we were talking about earlier. The, I showed you this plot. This is the all of the triggers discretized by month. And now I'm gonna show you the unrecognized triggers discretized by month. And you can see that a lot of those, as I pointed out, two and a half times more often are during the summertime and during summer afternoons. What we also did was we looked at the maximum temperatures for those unrecognized triggers. And what we see is that, sure enough, a lot of those rock falls are happening when the temperature is pretty hot out, over 30 degrees Celsius. That's a hot day, that's a 90 degree plus day. So we think that we're onto something here in explaining the database a little bit more, which was basically uh, the place that we started at. We wanted to know if we could say something about those unrecognized, uh, unrecognized rock falls, unrecognized triggering mechanism of rock falls. And we wanted to see if we could explain why rock falls happen on beautiful summer days. So I think we're onto something. We think we can revisit that database and try to explain some of those and certainly moving forward, do a better job so this study received a lot of press when we, we published a paper this past year, uh, including this one in the Daily Mail that said, is the sun destroying Yosemite's iconic cliffs? That wasn't our headline, that was theirs. But the, the point is uh, that yes, I guess, in a way. <laughs> I wouldn't use the word destroying, but uh, you know, sun and the thermal cycles probably do have something to do with the landscapes that we see in Yosemite. So moving back to fracture, and I wanna move back and close with discussing the current research we're doing over at Twain Heart. And so this, um, I'm gonna show that video again, but the video was taken on the other side of this bench, on the other side of the dome, and I said that that was just a minor event. This was the big one. This is all new rock surface. They stripped off all the rock from those first couple events. And you can see the thickness of the exfoliation sheets here. This is um, you know, about 40 centimeters, something like that. So all that rock actually popped off including, um, um, well, the, this very large area. So let's look, at, uh, let's look at the video one more time. So, yeah, you can hear somebody laughing in the background because it's <laughs> pretty exciting for them. So this event was in 2014, August 2014. There was five events in 30 days. Each event, as I mentioned, lasted several minutes. That's what allowed people to get out there and start filming. 
It had buckle slabs of up to 40 centimeters. This is one of those. This is a lifeguard tower that you see on top of the, the slab that was uplifted. Lifeguard tower is there because that reservoir is used as a recreational swimming facility. And this is a slab that's about 15 centimeters thick and popped up, you know, 40 centimeters. So from one of those early events. This one wasn't captured on film, unfortunately, but it would have been pretty spectacular to see something like that happen in real time. Cracking over about a 1,200 square meter area and no obvious cause. No earthquake, no rain, no snow. This was during the summertime. We got involved in this study to, because of its direct analogy with what we think might be going on in Yosemite in terms of thermal stresses. So that's why USGS is involved in a study here. And so those, those events in 2014, what I'm showing here is a date on the bottom starting from August 2014 uh, through December here, 2016. These are the events, the five events in 2014. We started measuring temperature at that site here. And temperature is on the, the y-axis on the right. And the blue line shows an extensometer data. Extensometer is an instrument that is put in the ground. We drill through the slab and we attach something uh, above the slab and below the slab. And that measures how much the slab is going to move up and down. So it's a measure of that deformation. Similar, just the same to the crack meters that we installed. Well, this is uh, installed a little bit differently because the slab's beneath our feet instead of on the side of a cliff. And so we've, we've been taking continuous measurements for quite some time. And what you can see over the course of a year is about four and a half centimeters of opening of that slab. Now we were looking at you know, a centimeter per day on, on the slab in Yosemite. This is uh, four centimeters per year, which is a lot more deformation than we saw on the slab per year. Um, and it also has the same diurnal cycle, the daily opening and closing. You don't see that here because I'm showing such a long time period. What happened in 2014, that was this big slab opening up. In 2015, the extensometer data showed that the sheet was moving rapidly outwards, so moving away from the, the bottom, uh, away from the earth, if you have, because now we're on a horizontal surface. And it coincided with some pretty hot temperatures, the maximum temperatures during that time period. And at that time, there wasn't a big exfoliation event, but there was cracking throughout the dam. So they had already poured new concrete for some of the repairs of the dam and the facilities, and we were seeing cracks opening up in that during that time period. And then in 2016, uh, just this past year, in June and July, there were two, again, energetic exfoliation events, smaller in scale than the 2015 ones, but spot on with the maximum temperatures uh, of, of 2016. And so I don't think it's any coincidence there that in these three time periods over the course of these past two years, that the cracking's only happening at the maximum temperatures. So heat's got to be playing a role here. And so uh, that's, the, you've seen this picture before, but that's what happened this past year in 2016. So can it really fracture rock? I think yes. I mean, we're seeing it there in Twain Hart, and again, that's the reason why we're studying this. And we've actually started putting it together. Uh, we had a lot of instruments put on the ground to measure all sorts of things, the stress, the strain, the deformation of the rock slab in Twain Hart to see if we can learn what it would take to cause rock falls in Yosemite in places that we're, we're trying to um, minimize the hazard and risk at. So with that, I'm going to end uh, with this slide. Can this really fracture rock? I think the answer is yes, and we see it here in Twain Hart, and I think we're seeing it in a lot of places in Yosemite. Thanks a lot for your attention, and these are all the collaborators I've worked with that I'd like to acknowledge. Well, thank you, Brian. I'm sure Brian would be happy to answer questions from the audience. There's a couple of microphones in the aisles there if people have questions. We can, we'd like to record the questions so others can, can hear as well. Uh, well, now you have a, um, a, a theory and then you have uh, uh, assay uh, methods. Uh, how are you going to use this? How are you using this, uh, um, this uh, work to uh, mitigate, to assess risk and uh, mitigate the risk? Yeah, that's a good question. I think in Yosemite what this means is that when there are rock falls happening on really hot days, we're not going to scratch our heads too much more and we're going to have a, a lot more confidence in assigning that trigger. Will we ever get to the point where we say watch out for rock falls because it's hot out? I think that's probably raising uh, the red flag a little too soon. Um, 
that would be about the same thing as saying it's raining out and watch out for rock falls. It's the same level of caution, I think, that you'd have to take. But I think what this does is actually, if we can get this out to, to people's minds and visitors and they can understand that um, rock falls are an active agent in the landscape and there's all sorts of different things that can cause them. I don't know. The, oh, the mic's on. Sorry. Um, do you have any anecdotal evidence from the climate community about seeing this level of deformation? Because I know people do put anchors in slabs, hopefully not in ones that are about to come off, but if you're seeing movement of four centimeters or more during the course of a day, uh, have you ever heard of anyone saying, yeah, I put an anchor there, but it moved because it got hot? Absolutely. <laughs> yep. For sure, and, and that was actually one thing I, I failed to mention, but in the early days of, of designing this experiment, that was actually some of the, the impetus and inspiration for even instrumenting one of these slabs. Greg and myself, just talking with lots of climbers, we've, we've all put in gear in a rock face as we're climbing, and then for whatever reason didn't take it out within a certain amount of time, and it got stuck there. And I think a lot of climbers think that, oh, that's just bad climbing. You, you, know, you shouldn't put your gear in that place, and you got it stuck. That's your fault. And you know, it's easy to blame yourself when you talk to a lot of people with the same experience. All of a sudden, it's like, oh, really? Like, you're a professional climber. You're really good at this. You, you know better than that. How did you get your gear stuck? And so it started sort of cranking the wheels and saying, well, maybe, <laughs> maybe these rocks are closing in on the gear. And so that was actually one of the, the drivers for that. And so that actually led us to instrument that flake and say, well, that's a place. So great question. Yeah. So your thermal, uh, you know, uh, fluxing um, data is very interesting and kind of that, that all makes sense. And I can visualize that. But a big um, blob of the pie chart was uh, precipitation as a cause. And I can't really get my head around what what could be causing that? Do you have any thoughts on what's going on there? Yeah, so precipitation-related uh, failures are, are, as I showed, one of the, well, it is the, the, um, the responsible for the largest number of rock falls. The mechanism behind that is generally that the, when it rains, the, the water will flow into fractures behind the rock cliff. And those fractures aren't always perfectly drained at the bottom. So the water can actually pond up in back of the sheets, let's say, and the water pressures will actually be enough to, to dislodge that. Could also, that's, that's the most commonly invoked mechanism, and, and there's lots of studies that show that that can happen. The other way is that it can actually just erode particles off the base of these partially attached blocks, maybe something sitting on a ledge, and then erodes the base, and that can slide off. So you were speaking about how the whole slab heating up causes it to bow, but do you have any data about differential heating from the outside to the inside of this slab, and whether that may have also played a role? And it did, yeah. In our analyses, um, so we have the temperature data from the outside. We also have temperature data from the inside. And that's the thermal gradient that I was referencing. So the whole sheet heats up, and that has some part of the bowing outwards when the stresses uh, are enough to, to make it buckle. But the thermal gradient itself can actually make, make a bowing failure as well. And so it's a separate analysis, but the same, same mech. Uh, I shouldn't say it's the same mechanism. It's a different mechanism, but the same result in that it's going to bow it outwards. So that thermal gradient uh, is part of it. Uh, what I haven't done is see which, which part is more significant. In our analysis, we have a numerical analysis where we plug all this in numbers and equations. We include those both, those both components, the expansion and the gradient uh, effect. In your uh, thermal uh, studies, have you taken into account for... Uh, climate change and what has happened over the years as climate has changed from when well, started in 1858, I think, and we're still going on. So we've had some ups and downs in our uh, planet's uh, climate. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Uh, it is something that we've considered. We've thought about it. I think on the time scale of this experiment, we're not seeing that, although uh, when we sort of carry this into the future, we, we could say that I think the most important thing is going to be the temperature cycle. So will the temperatures uh, be different more, the, the low versus the high? If the highs also, um, you know, if the highs and the lows both move out, then we have that same difference, even just at a hotter scale. And um, uh, so it's something that could be I guess, carried out in a future analysis, but on this time scale, it doesn't, doesn't seem to affect our analysis. 
So sort of related to that, um, it seems like the, especially the daily thermal gradient is largely driven by solar. So I was just wondering if you have mapped out where the rockfalls occur relative to, are they on south facing slopes, north facing slopes, and their exposure to the sun? Right, uh, well I can, I can give two pieces of information for that. One is related to the solar, we actually measured light intensity on this. What we found was that when the flake, when the sheet was in the sun, it mattered, but it didn't matter as much as temperature. Um, the daily, just the temperature increases are enough. So even on a cloudy day, it was still increasing enough if the temperature was going. So the, the ambient temperature increase was more important than the solar uh, effect. But looking at south-facing and north-facing cliffs, we had thought about, once this experiment was going, we thought about, um, this is a south-facing uh, cliff, by the way, and that was purposeful to, because we thought if we're going to measure an effect, it's, it's going to be on a south-facing cliff. So, so good point to make there. Um, we had thought about doing one tandem on the north-facing uh, cliffs on the south side of the valley. Um, just decided to sort of pursue this study, but I think it's something that that we could look at in the future for sure. Um, so you've been saying that uh, it wouldn't make sense to do uh, warnings for high heat days for risk, but what about maybe geoengineering for structurally significant areas like where a dam is buttressed into one of these domes, perhaps uh, painting the rock white to reduce how much it heats up? Yeah, well, so I think that it enters a, I shouldn't say politically sensitive, but uh, it enters a new realm of thinking. So in Yosemite, most of it's wilderness, and so very little is going to be done to the, the cliffs. If you started sort of uh, saying that's an unstable cliff and peeling off all the loose ones, you'd have to do it to the whole valley, or you'd have to you know, lay it back at 45 degrees and change the landscape. So we don't do that in the national parks, but um, there are examples of people doing that on, on built infrastructure. And in fact, that dam that I show at Twain Hart, what they did was they separated the dam itself from the rock by drilling a series of holes through that sheet. And so if the sheet does expand or crack or anything like that, it doesn't affect the dam because now there's like this, this sort of buffering effect. So there are ways to mitigate that stress by just decoupling the, the part that's stressing from whatever you're trying to protect. So, yeah, good point. Hi, so um, you're watching the cycling of the uh, movement of the, the, the uh, flakes. Is there any possibility in high importance areas that you could use something like LIDAR or, or Landsat or some kind of satellite to, to just monitor it constantly? And then if it's um, bowing constantly a lot, maybe you know, oh, that one's getting near uh, flaking off or something like that? Right. Is that feasible? Yeah, uh, well, we've pursued several different options for looking at uh, applications of those kind of technologies. One uh, problem with that is that there, it's such a small amount of movement for uh, a, um, a remote sensing type operation that they wouldn't pick up millimeter type movement. Centimeter, though, uh, could be picked up. And we did an experiment with a terrestrial radar. So this is a ground-based radar that actually is um, more accurate than even LIDAR. Um, you can get down to, to millimeter and submillimeter deformations. One of the problems with that ended up being that the pixel size, uh, the size that you're monitoring, is actually larger than the exfoliation sheets that are out there. And so that then means that you're actually measuring something that could be moving, and uh, something that's probably not moving, and it blended the signal. But I think there's a lot of potential for those types of uh, remote sensing methods, I think. You know, this is just the beginning of some of these techniques, especially radar. I think the pixel size will get, get smaller and smaller with advancements in technology. So. Okay, well, thank you, Brian. Thank you all for coming tonight. Thank you.